You are listening to WCAT Radio, your station for quality Catholic programming. Your selected program will begin right after a word from our sponsor, Group M7.com, a web design and hosting company. Log on to Group M7.com today and let them know that WCAT Radio sent you. You know, my finest childhood memories was the Saturday morning movies for about four bits each. My brother and I could split a Coke and a big box of popcorn and watch movies about Tarzan, Jane, and their Amazon River adventures. Well, maybe that's where Jeff Bezos took his name. His Amazon.com is now the largest online retailer in the world. I'm Michael Malfood with Group M7, the oldest and largest website design firm in East Texas. And here's my point. And as usual, it's a good one. If your website is modern and up-to-date, mobile and search engine friendly, it matters not whether you sell a product or provide information about your goods and services. Your sales justifiably will increase just like theirs. The world uses the Internet. We can improve your website and your email. Look at our giant portfolio at groupm7.com. Since 1995, there's only one web and there's only one group, and it's us. It's Group M7. You're listening to WCAT Radio, your home for authentic Catholic programming. Welcome everyone to Polycarp's Paradigm. My name is Eric Robinson. So glad to be with you all on this fine day. Well, we're continuing our series on my new book, Essays in the Deep. Faith and Reason, Meaning and Morality, Protestantism and Catholic Thought. And uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm very excited to jump in today with you guys. You know, it's I say it's a new book, but it's been out for over a month now by the time you're listening to this. And you can find it on Amazon. Just type in Essays in the Deep. And we've gone over a lot so far. We talked about uh, faith and reason and science and, and philosophy and how all of those interrelate We talked about the morality of uh, contraception, abortion, and transgenderism, and a little bit on the meaning of life there as well. And today we're going to be talking about Jesus and his resurrection, specifically targeting uh, skeptics that maybe claim that the early disciples invented God's uh, Christ's divinity when he came to the earth, and just saying that 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 was like an extrapolation after the fact uh, that the resurrection didn't really happen. Uh, but what we'll see today is that, in fact, uh, with all of the evidence, what really counts is how you come into reading the scriptures. What is your philosophical framework before even opening the Bible? And that colors your whole interpretation. So, the two essays I want to go over today is uh, Essay 13, A Divine Walk, Exegetical Analysis of Jesus Walking on Water, And then Essay 14, Resurrection Interpreted, Hermeneutic of Skepticism or Faith. So let's begin with Essay 13, A Divine Walk, Exegetical Analysis of Jesus Walking on Water. And I'll read the introduction to this essay, and then we'll um, skip around here a a bit. Uh, But I say this, Who is Jesus? The answer to this question changes everything. For if the real historical Jesus is God, and not merely a man, then he commands our obedience and worship. If Jesus is just a man, then we can perhaps apply some of his moral teachings to our lives, if so desired. But there would certainly be no obligation to serve and center our lives on him. Many skeptical modern scholars like Bart Ehrman claim that the early Christians eventually made Jesus to be God after having visions of his resurrection. Though the Gospel of John clearly portrays the divinity of Jesus, the Gospel was written around A.D. 90, which leaves a 60-year gap for Christ's divinity to be developed by the nascent church. The earliest Gospel writing we have, namely the Gospel of Mark, which was written around A.D. 66, Ehrman says, has no significant claims to Christ's intrinsic divinity, but rather sees Jesus as a human being later made or exalted to the divine. For this reason, Ehrman says, the evidence for Jesus' Jesus' claims to be divine come only from the last of the New Testament Gospels, not from any earlier sources. Is this true? 
Does Jesus do nothing to demonstrate his divinity in the earlier Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and or Luke? The story of Jesus walking on water, with all of its underpinnings in the Old Testament descriptions of God, is perhaps the most notable demonstration of Christ's divinity in his public ministry before his death and resurrection. This story is recorded in the later Gospel of John, but also in the earlier Gospels of Matthew and Mark. Despite some differences in detail, each of these accounts dramatically point to Jesus being God, the God of Israel in the flesh. Upon closer examination of these texts, using both the historical critical method and the patristic approach, we will not only see Christ's divine nature, but also our call to divinization and the implications this story has for our lives today. Okay, so there we set the scene, right? Skeptics like Bart Ehrman are saying, you know what, Jesus... This, this idea that Jesus is God, or God in the flesh, his divinity, that was invented later on. It developed over time later on. But, you know, the real Jesus is was just a human being. Maybe he had some prophetic powers or something, but he's just a human being, and then later was exalted to be like this demigod or something like that. But that whole theory is based on this other theory that... There are no claims to Christ's divinity in the Gospel of Mark or or Matthew or even Luke. And so the question is, is that true? And, And so we look at this story of Jesus walking on water. And something you have to keep in mind is that this was written in the Jewish context, right? that uh, they are very familiar with the God of Israel from the Old Testament, very familiar with how this all works. Um, and so that's that's going to be an important uh, contextual piece. Now, why do the scriptures um, testify of Jesus walking on water at the time that he did? Well, uh, it has to do with the the, the Eucharist, actually. <laughs> believe it or not. And so the context with which Jesus walks on water in all of the Gospels, it comes usually right after the multiplication of the loaves and fishes. The multiplication of the loaves and fishes to the 5,000 is actually a prefiguration of the institution of the Eucharist at the Last Supper. So this is a profound connection. And so when, when Jesus takes the loaves and fishes... He blesses, breaks, and gives them to his disciples to then give to the crowds. In the Last Supper, he does the exact same liturgical action. He takes the bread, he blesses it, breaks it, and gives it to them. And says, take, eat, this is my body, drink, this is my blood. And so, how can bread and wine become Jesus' actual body and blood? Well, that can only happen if Christ is actually divine. And, and the, the apostles and their successors can only do it insofar as they're in the person of Christ. And Christ himself is the one speaking these words, changing bread into his body. And so, of course, to go from the multiplication of loaves and fishes, which by itself is a very prophetic and powerful act, but it wouldn't necessarily need Christ to be divine for that to happen. He could just be a prophet or something. But... To make bread and wine into his body and blood, now that would require him to be divine. And thus we see uh, the story of Jesus walking on water couched in that context. So that's the first point uh, that, that must be made here. Okay. So there's these different accounts, and I will just read Mark's account of, of Jesus walking on water. Um. And I'm doing this intentionally because Mark, once again, is the earliest gospel we have, uh, according to some modern scholars. Others believe that Matthew is actually the earliest. And the difference, the big difference between Matthew's account and Mark's account is that Matthew continues with this scene of Peter asking uh, to go out and walk on water if it's really Jesus and not a ghost, right? And the gospel of John is, is, a, is a little different as well. Um, in in that in the way it relates the story, but the essence or the essential factors of the story are the same. Okay, so Mark's account says this, and this is Mark six forty five through fifty two. Immediately he made his disciples get into the boat 
and go before him to the other side, to Bethsaida, where he dismissed the crowd. And after he had taken leave of them, he went up on the mountain to pray. And when evening came, the boat was out on the sea, and he was alone on the land. And he saw that they were distressed in rowing, for the wind was against them. And about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them, walking on the sea. He meant to pass by them. But when they saw him walking on the sea, they thought it was a ghost and cried out. For they all saw him and were terrified. But immediately he spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I. Have no fear. And he got into the boat with them, and the wind ceased. And they were utterly astounded. For they did not understand about the loaves, but their hearts were hardened. Okay, so that's the earliest account, according to scholars, some scholars that we have. Matthew's account, which according to other scholars is the earliest, at the very end, after Peter uh, gets, you know, he, he walks on water for a little bit, but then starts drowning, Jesus saves him. And then the very end of that gospel, it says, and they got into the boat, that is Jesus and Peter, and the wind ceased. And those in the boat worshipped him, saying, truly, you are the son of God. So, Literally, in Matthew's account, they are worshiping Jesus. You only worship God. Thus, the disciples recognize this scene of Jesus walking on water as his, as him being divine, as him being the God of Israel in the flesh. Um, so first, just by that fact alone, we can see that Bar Ehrman's claim that the earlier Gospels don't have any claims to Christ divinity is uh, quite wrong. And uh, the Gospel of John, uh, in each of these Gospels, you know, Jesus responds with saying, It is I. Do not be afraid. It is I. Do not do not be afraid. Okay. So, now we're going to get into some of the fun part of dissecting this a little bit to just show how much Christ divinity is showed in this story alone. And thus to prove the skeptics that claim that it was invented later in the Gospel of John completely false. So, the question remains, how did this encounter with Jesus walking on water reveal his divine nature? Right. So, we saw that the disciples recognize that Christ is divine from this in, in Matthew's account. They, they worship him. But how does this come about? Well, you, once again, you have to keep in mind that these are Jewish men who know the Old Testament pretty well. And so they're thinking about this in the context of the God of Israel, Yahweh. The question remains, how did this encounter with Jesus walking on water reveal his divine nature? For the answer to this, we must turn to the Old Testament and see how these first disciples who were faithful Jews would have understood the scene in the context of God's revelation to the ancient people of Israel. Water and wind play a significant role in this story and hearken us back to the God of Israel who alone stretched out the heavens and trampled the waves of the sea. Job 9.8 So Jesus, walking on the waves of the Sea of Galilee, is a trampling that only God has the power to do. He is making his way, quote-unquote, through the sea, and a, quote-unquote, path through the great waters where his, quote-unquote, footprints are unseen. This is from Psalm 77.19, also compared to Isaiah 43:16. So I'm going to I'm going to read that again without all the quotations for you. <laughs> Jesus walking on the waves of the Sea of Galilee is a trampling that only God has the power to do. He is making his way through the sea and a path through the great waters where his footprints are unseen. And then Psalm 77:16, when the waters saw you, O God, when the waters saw you, they were afraid. Yes, the deep trembled. Not only do the waters tremble beneath the feet of Jesus, but the disciples tremble for fear of thinking that he was a ghost. But out of the darkness of the night, Jesus speaks. Who now has the power to speak over the mighty waters? But the Lord God Almighty himself. The voice of the Lord is upon the waters. The God of glory thunders. The Lord upon many waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord full of majesty. Psalm 29, 3-4. through 4. Before Jesus speaks, Mark's account says he meant to pass by them. Mark six forty eight. Well, I'll get back to that in just a second. So first of all, just the fact that Jesus is walking on water 
is a sign to these men that this is God. (laughs) Because only God can do something like that. Only God is the one who tramples upon the waters. When God speaks, the waters tremble, and they were trembling with fear. Wow, I mean, what an incredible thing. Jesus walking on water is just by its very self is, is displaying his divinity. Okay, but then we have this. He meant to pass by them, according to Mark 6.48. This is no minor detail, but an allusion to the Old Testament, wherein Yahweh passed by Moses and Elijah, who could not see his face. From Exodus 33, 19, 22, 34, 6, and 1 Kings 19, 11. So Yahweh passed by Moses and Elijah, who could not see his face. At two different scenes, of course, in the Old Testament. With Jesus, however, God finally does stop and visits his people, who then worship him. And this is coming uh, from Dr. Matthew Ramage's book, Jesus Interpreted. Okay, so I'm going to read that again. That, that, that detail in the Gospel of Mark that he meant to pass by them is hearkening us back to Moses and Elijah where God passed by them. So Moses is like begging God, like, please show me your face. And, and God's like, well, you can't see my face, but um, I'll, I will pass by you and you can see my back. But in this Gospel account, finally, God shows his face in the face of Jesus. So God finally stops and visits his people who then worship him. What then does Jesus say upon these mighty waters? And this is my favorite part. And this is the most just obvious claim to Christ's divinity in these gospel passages. The same words that served as the first revelation of God's name to Moses at the burning bush are now the very words of Jesus to identify himself. Ego eimi in the Greek. So in the Greek Septuagint, when God says, I am who I am, or I am who am, that is ego eimi. And he uses the exact same words to say, it is I. So he says in the Greek, which means I am. Dr. Matthew Ramage points out that many Bibles translate the text, it is I. But there are more compelling reasons for the translation, I am. Okay, so chief among those reasons is the detail we covered of Jesus intending to pass by and the overall scene itself where Jesus is walking on water and stilling the wind. Something only I am could naturally do. So unfortunately, our English translations just say, it is I, (laughs) don't be afraid. (laughs) But what it should say is, I am, do not be afraid. Which is a clear, clear uh, portrayal of Christ's divinity, his own claim to divinity. Right then and there in the earliest gospel, in both of the early gospels, Matthew and Mark, he says, Ego eimi, I am. Boom. Christ Jesus is God in the flesh. Pope Benedict the Sixteenth explains this. At first sight, this instance of the words, I am he, seems to be a simple identifying formula by means of which Jesus enables his followers to recognize him so as to calm their fear. This interpretation does not go far enough, however, for at this point Jesus gets into the boat and the wind ceases. John adds that then they quickly reach the shore. The remarkable thing is is that only now do the disciples really begin to fear, the sort of fear that overwhelms man when he finds himself immediately exposed to the presence of God himself. It is this divine terror that comes upon the disciples here. For walking on the waters is a divine prerogative. The Jesus who walks upon the waters is not simply the familiar Jesus. In this new Jesus, they suddenly recognize the presence of God himself. There is no doubt that the whole event is a theophany, an encounter with the mystery of Jesus' divinity. Okay, so that is basically taking the historical critical approach to these texts of saying, like, what is actually the text saying? And it is saying... Christ is divine. Wow. The early church fathers now, they interpret a lot of things more symbolically, and that's where things can get really fun. So first, obviously, the Catholic Church says, take the literal sense of the scriptures, and then you can go into like the allegorical or the anagogical uh, senses of scripture, you know, how that relates to our salvation, and also how we can pull out morals from it. And so... Um, 
according to a lot of the early church fathers, it says, The boat in which the disciples are in, led by Peter, is an image of the church in which the bark which in full sail the Lord's cross by the breath of the Holy Spirit navigates safely in the world. According to another dear image dear to the church fathers, the church is prefigured by Noah's Ark, which alone saves from the flood. For by Noah's Ark, the church is signified, and the holy ones who are in it dwell secure in a flood of tribulations. The wind and waves can be interpreted as the prince of the power of the air, and the tribulations faced by the church, so that the disciples, tossed by the wind and the waves, is the church struggling against all the storms of this world raised by the opposition of the unclean spirit. As St. Augustine says, for when, any of an, for when any of a wicked will and of a great power proclaims a persecution of the church, then it is that a mighty wave rises against the boat of Christ. The initial distance between Christ and the disciples depicted by their ship being in the middle of the sea and Christ alone on the land shows how the church is sometimes oppressed with such persecution that her Lord may seem to have forsaken her for a season. But it is no accident that Jesus comes at the fourth watch of the night, which according to the ancient Roman way of keeping time was the last stretch of night before dawn. This led the early fathers to consider this scene as a prefiguration of Jesus' second coming in glory. So this is where it gets pretty fun. And so this is St. Hilary of Portier here. The first watch was therefore the law, uh, was therefore of the law the second of the prophets, the third of his coming in the flesh, and the fourth watch, his return in glory. I love the the church fathers and their interpretations of these scriptures. It's just incredible. Um, St. Augustine of Hippo says this, In the fourth watch of the night, that is, when the night is nearly ended, he shall come in the end of the world, when the night of iniquity is past, to judge the quick and the dead. But his coming was with a wonder. The waves swelled, but they were trodden upon. Thus, howsoever the powers of this world shall swell themselves, our head shall crush their head. And then St. Hilary of Portier again says, But Christ coming in the end shall find his church wearied and tossed by the spirit of Antichrist and by the troubles of the world. And because of their long experience of Antichrist, they will be troubled at every novelty of trial They shall have fear even at the approach of the Lord, suspecting deceitful appearances. But the good Lord banishes their fear, saying, It is I, and by proof of his presence takes away their dread of impending shipwreck. Okay, so uh, I'll conclude with uh, this, this part of our conversation about Essay 13, which is this quote from Pope Benedict XVI. And he says this, This is an image for the time of the church, intended also for us. The Lord is on the mountain of the Father. Therefore he sees us. Therefore he can get into the boat of our life at any moment. Therefore we can always call on him. We can always be certain that he sees and hears us in our own day too. The boat of the church travels against the headwind of history through the turbulent ocean of time. Often it looks as if it is bound to sink. But the Lord is there. And he comes at the right moment. I go away and I will come to you. And that is the source of Christian trust, the reason for our joy. Okay, so that is really a great way of displaying how the Catholic Church recommends uh, or shows us to to interpret these texts, right? So first, starting with that historical, literal sense of the scriptures and then going into the allegorical and then seeing, okay, now how does this apply to our lives? All that to say is that whole essay is geared towards one thing, to just show that Christ's divinity is certainly displayed in the earlier Gospels. Uh, Jesus saying, I am. (laughs) It is I. I am. Be not afraid. Okay. Well, essay 14 is an interesting essay. Resurrection interpreted hermeneutic of skepticism or faith. Um. And I'll begin with the introduction to this essay and, um, and go from there. So every person has a lens through which they see the world. We bring this lens to the sacred scriptures before even a page is read. Modern scholars are no exception to this rule. And this, is, this quote right here is a, coming from Dr. Matthew Ramage's book, Jesus Interpreted. 
if one is agnostic like Ehrman, then a natural explanation will be adduced from these phenomena. But on the other hand, a person who approaches the Bible assuming theism to be true will be open to taking the healing story at face value and will attribute it to Jesus' divine mastery over the natural order. The reality is that our conclusions about a given text are in large part governed by principles and commitments we had before opening up the Bible. Okay. The chief philosophical presupposition underlying the skepticism of modernity is that God cannot enter in and act in human history. If this is true, then alternative naturalistic explanations must be proposed to determine the real history behind the Christian belief in the incarnation and resurrection, among other beliefs, because it has already been determined that it is impossible for God to become man, since God doesn't act in human history. Since the Gospels, along with the rest of scriptures, attest to God acting in history for the salvation of mankind, can we trust them? Can we trust that this particular record of history is real history? Because it is of the very essence of biblical faith to be about real historical events, these questions are not superfluous, but get to the very root of Christianity. The Apostle Paul even says that if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. Honing in on the arguments of Bar Ehrman concerning the resurrection and contrasting them with that of Pope Benedict XVI, we will be able to see how the same data can be interpreted differently depending on whether or not someone approaches the scriptures with a hermeneutic of skepticism or faith. With Pope Benedict XVI and others who approach the scriptures through a hermeneutic of faith, we can boldly say, I trust the Gospels, and that this Jesus, the Jesus of the Gospels, is a historically plausible and convincing figure. This conviction is grounded in the historical event of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the primary proof of Christ's divinity and God acting in human history. And so basically setting the stage there of saying, you know what, there's a modern philosophical presupposition that skeptics have when coming to the Bible, and that is that God doesn't actually exist, or even if he does, he doesn't actually act in human history. And that's a modern, you know, philosophical flaw. You know, that's just like a belief, right? Uh, and and so when they see the claims of the scriptures saying, like, God actually did part the Red Sea, or he actually did walk on water, as we just saw, um, or he did uh, raise from the dead, like, they're saying, no, well, that's impossible because we know that God doesn't actually act in history. So something else must have happened. Oh, really? Do you, do you know that God doesn't act in history? That's a pretty pretty crazy thing to just know that out with no proof, even though there's all this proof that he does act in history. And so to combat that, we, we, we're going to see that through the same data here, um, you know, it, you can interpret it through that lens of skepticism or the lens of faith. And so I'm going to quickly um, go over uh, Bar Ehrman's uh, argument, and then we'll go to Pope Benedict's here. Um, so really, all the Gospels testify that the, the tomb is empty, right? And so basically... Here's here's Ehrman's argument. I'll just summarize what I've written here. Is that he believes that the disciples after Jesus' death were experiencing some sort of trauma that they then had visions of Jesus. And they, they truly believed that he was raised. Um, they, they believed that. Uh, they they claimed to have visions of this. And they don't just claim to have visions, but they, they even interpreted these visions because they had this quote-unquote apocalyptic worldview Um, that it would be a bodily resurrection. So when they saw these visions, they automatically assumed that he was bodily raised. And then they started spreading those rumors about. So that is his basic argument or interpretation of the accounts uh, there. And I would say that the strengths of Ehrman's argument are that he does take into account the apocalyptic worldview and expectations of the Jews during the time of Jesus. And so I do appreciate how Ehrman readily admits that this would involve a bodily and not just a spiritual resurrection, and it's beyond dispute the disciples believed Christ to be raised from the dead. The connections Ehrman highlights between the resurrection and Christological development is also sensible, 
so basically he's saying, okay, so they didn't really believe he was divine until after the resurrection, um, and then that just developed based on these visions. But the question is whether the Christology developed during this period was the fruit of truthful and providential reflection upon the mystery of Jesus, or whether it was a misguided, delusional, desperate, or even conniving power play. And this is where the philosophical presuppositions are exposed. Um, So though obviously astute in certain aspects of the historical context, Ehrman shows his philosophical hand when seeming to go beyond the text into theories rooted in his skepticism. The weaknesses of his argument involve the lack of attention to other historical evidence that seems to counteract the line, his line of thought. For one, even the secular Jewish historian Josephus provides extra-biblical evidence of the empty tomb. In the narrative traditions shown in the Gospels, women, especially Mary Magdalene, play a key role in witnessing the resurrection. If the disciples were hallucinating and redacting texts later on to prove their visions in developing Christology then it seems they would have eliminated the testimony of women as they were not perceived to be trustful witnesses in the juridical tradition of that time. This theory of Ehrman's seems to overlook the profound witness and character of those early witnesses to the resurrection. From the historical records, there was a dramatic change in the boldness and faithfulness of these disciples and an abundance of disciples who shared the same conviction as to the truth and reality of the resurrection, It does not seem likely that so many people would believe the testimony of the early disciples had they been untrustworthy or delusional. Lastly, to say that the apocalyptic worldview of the disciples would lend them to interpret hallucinations of Jesus in terms of evidence for bodily resurrection does not actually contribute evidence toward the theory of mere visions and seems to presume that their apocalyptic worldview was wrong. Perhaps their worldview was a necessary preparation for them to make sense of so magnanimous of an event, an event that really happened and still exceeded all expectations. And so, yeah, if the disciples are hallucinating, having visions, what have you, and then later on they're like, okay, this means he's God, they develop that later on, well then why would they include the testimony of women as the first witnesses of the resurrection when in that context... Women were not trusted in the court of law. They were not supposed to be witnesses in the court of law. Uh, Only men were. And so that would not make sense. And so that's like, well, no, this actually just happened. And so we have to just write what what happened. Okay. Um, Now, the thing with Pope Benedict's interpretation of the resurrection accounts, because there's different details that happen in the different gospels, right? Um, But what he does is he takes... There's a confessional tradition and there's a narrative tradition. And basically, Pope Benedict says that there's like an essence to the stories and there are accidents or details to these stories. We all share, they all share the same essence, that Christ bodily raised from the dead, that the tomb is empty and all of that. But the details of that, like, you know, maybe there's an angel that appears in this story or not in this story. He appears on the road to Emmaus in Luke, but not in Matthew or John. You know, so there's these different details that happen different encounters, uh, but the kernel of faith, the essence, is the same. Um, So, classic in Benedict's exegesis is that distinction. He says that the confessional tradition authoritatively authoritatively condenses the shared faith of Christianity in fixed formulae and insists on their binding character down to the letter for the whole believing community. Whereas the narrative traditions are not binding in every detail in the same way, but by virtue of being taken up into the Gospels, they are clearly to be regarded as valid testimony given content and shape to the faith. For the confessions presuppose the narratives and grew out of them and express in concentrated form the nucleus and narrative of the narrative content, and at the same time they point back toward the narratives. So, so the two, two traditions are intertwined and fundamental to our understanding of the historical truth of the resurrection. Um, And so he says this, although the Catholic need not affirm every last detail in the narratives that could be, uh, that those details could be captured on a video camera, a hermeneutic of faith tends to accept each discrete appearance as historical, unless there is compelling evidence to suppose it was intended to be taken parabolically. Okay. So there's like this assumption, like, no, like, we, we believe that God can do this, and, and he did. And so, 
I I love what Pope Benedict then says here. And so, uh, well, first to cover the difference again. Um, The fundamental difference, however, between Pope Benedict and Bart Ehrman is that for Pope Benedict, the resurrection of Christ was an actual historical event that necessitated a rethinking of God's action in and through Jesus. Even the apocalyptic worldview that that may have prepared them for the bodily resurrection, as Ehrman postulates, would not be enough to see this recapitulation of salvation history. The bodily resurrection of Christ was physical, yet not bound by the law of physics. It was a historical event that nevertheless bursts open the dimensions of history and transcends it. This is why the encounters with the resurrected Christ, as articulated in the four Gospels, vary in detail and remain mysterious. It is as if the authors were grasping for words to report such real and transcendent encounters with the risen Lord. The resurrection was akin to a radical evolutionary leap in which a new dimension of life emerges, a new dimension of human existence. And this is coming from Pope Benedict's book, Jesus of Nazareth, Holy Week. Wow. So basically he's saying like, when Christ was raised from the dead, it's like an evolutionary leap in humanity. Like he is fully divinized human nature now. Like absolutely like the, his body is now um, in this state where it can go through walls, but it's also physical and can eat fish. Like what? And so, and this gives us hope for the future resurrection. So it's, it's bodily, it's physical, but it's also completely transcendent and just utterly new. Uh, It's a, it's a new body. It's the same body, but made new, I should say. And so, because it's so transcendent, but also so real, it's like the details of these accounts, are they're just grasping for words. It's, it's, and so this is the way he's interpreting this. So while Ehrman perceives the accounts of these mysterious encounters with the risen Christ as evidence that the disciples were just having visions, Benedict perceives a genuine articulation of history the history of an altogether new, transformative, and transcendent event. The boldness of apostolic preaching would seem inexplicable inexplicable, had these been mere visions and not real encounters. So Pope Benedict explains um, that really that um, that boldness of apostolic preaching is the fruit of like a real encounter. So... The one of the biggest pieces of evidence too that this really happened; these aren't just hallucinations. Uh, is that other people actually did believe them, and then also they actually changed their whole religious liturgical worship <laughs> based on this. So the boldness of preaching was matched by the boldness of religious practice. Immediately after encountering the risen Christ that first day of the week, that Sunday, Christian worship found its new Sabbath on that day. Only an event of extraordinary impact could have led to the abandonment of the Sabbath and its replacement by the first day of the week. For Pope Benedict XVI, the celebration of the Lord's Day, which was a characteristic part of of the Christian community from the outset, is one of the most convincing proofs that something extraordinary happened that day. The discovery of the empty tomb and the encounter with the risen Lord. Wow, so... That's huge, right? You don't just change everything all at once unless something incredible happens. And so I I know I've kind of gone on a little bit longer than I was hoping, but I will just finish with this conclusion that I wrote in this chapter. As a man of faith, I cannot deny my predisposed draw towards the hermeneutic of faith expounded by Pope Benedict XVI. Recognizing that I cannot be unbiased, as no one can be, I have observed the evidence that the different theories surrounding the resurrection find that both Ehrman and Benedict have plausible approaches. Though both are plausible, which is more probable? While miracles are improbable by their very nature, and the resurrection constitutes a miracle par excellence, I find it more probable that the event of the resurrection actually happened in history. If the disciples had mere visions and died believing those visions to be real encounters with the risen Lord, I find it highly unlikely that people would still believe, still talk about, still experience, and still die for Jesus today. After all, 
He was an obscure carpenter from a know-nothing town in a remote part of the Roman Empire who died in utter humiliation upon the cross. What are the odds that someone so obscure and dying in such a cruel way would still be the center of our theological conversations to this day? What is it about Jesus of Nazareth that keeps skeptics and saints alike inevitably drawn to him? The probable explanation to all of this, in my opinion, is that Jesus was actually raised from the dead. Moreover, he actually did what he said he would do after he ascended. Jesus sent the Holy Spirit upon the church to guide her into all truth and prepare her to welcome him at his return. This is why we continually see the bold witness and impeccable lives of those who truly seek to be conformed to the life of Christ. We see martyrs in every age and in every place testifying to the reality of Christ crucified and Christ raised from the dead. Dr. Ramage sums up well the various motives of credibility which turn the improbable miracle of the resurrection into a probable historical fact. Dr. Ramage says this, When it comes to the resurrection, I would suggest this sort of plausible explanation may come from a variety of places, through our own personal experience of beauty and holiness in the same church that claims that Jesus rose from the dead, through the freedom and happiness that comes through obedience to the church's moral teachings, through the church's indefectibility over the centuries, through the peaceful fortitude of martyrs across the ages, in particular Jesus' first disciples, who gave their lives for Christ, etc. So in the end, we all have a choice, right? To choose the hermeneutic of skepticism or the hermeneutic of faith, which is also a gift from God. Though the agnostic Ehrman encourages readers to bring hope to a world devoid of hope and to love and be loved, the very philosophical framework by which he is operating lends itself neither to hope nor to love but to utter meaninglessness. In contrast, the hermeneutic of faith that has colored the life and work of Pope Benedict XVI, seamlessly directs our hearts to hope and our lives to love. For in this framework of faith, we are always drawn back to Christ crucified and risen from the dead. In this paschal mystery, we find meaning, even in our suffering, the type of meaning that gives us strength to persevere in love to the end. So that's it, folks. That's... uh the two essays I want to share this time, and I will conclude when I pick this series back up uh, on the Protestant revolt and Catholic reform and the necessity of visible unity throughout the church. And so really, um, essay 15 coming up is actually my favorite essay to go over, and so I think you'll enjoy that. And that one's called Protestant Revolt and Catholic Reform, and then the Visible Unity one uh, is a is a good one too, and that was written as a preliminary to my thesis. But anyway, hope you are are enjoying this series. I uh, hope you get the book Essays in the Deep. You can find it on Amazon, and hope this was helpful for you all in showing Christ's divinity and the proof uh, for His resurrection. How people come uh, with different philosophical frameworks when they interpret scriptures, and so just being mindful of that is very very important. And uh, And so I hope that this stirs your faith to follow Christ and to increase in the virtues, the theological virtues of faith, hope, and love. God bless. The mission of Holy Apostles College and Seminary is to form faithful witnesses of Christ. Year after year, the prestigious Newman Guide has recommended Holy Apostles for our academic excellence and steadfast fidelity to the magisterial teachings of the Catholic Church. We are also fully accredited and the leader in Catholic online learning.
our students enjoy the unsurpassed flexibility to study on their own time and anywhere in the world through asynchronous engagement. Holy Apostles is dedicated to the relentless pursuit of truth, which allows students in all academic programs, including undergraduate, graduate, and personal interest, to formulate a coherent worldview based on both faith and reason. The study of the liberal arts also develops and refines key competencies associated with career readiness, such as critical thinking and problem solving, clear communication, collaboration, and a strong work ethic. The tuition rate at Holy Apostles is one of the most affordable in the country. Yearly tuition for a full-time undergraduate is under $12,000. Students at Holy Apostles can graduate with minimal or even no college debt, which enables them to live out their calling as faithful witnesses of Christ without heavy financial burdens holding them back. Please visit www.holyapostles.edu forward slash admissions for more information. The fall 2021 admissions deadline is Friday, July 23rd. Classes start Monday, August 30th. See you soon. Hello, God's beloved. I'm Annabelle Mosley, author, professor of theology, and host of Then Sings My Soul and Destination Sainthood on WCAT Radio. I invite you to listen in and find inspiration along this sacred journey we're traveling together to make our lives a masterpiece and, with God's grace, become saints. Join me, Annabelle Mosley, for Then Sings My Soul and Destination Sainthood on WCAT Radio. God bless you. Remember, you're never alone. God is always with you. Thank you for listening to a production of WCAT Radio. Please join us in our mission of evangelization. And don't forget, love lifts up where knowledge takes flight.